Hi, this is going to be a video walkthrough tutorial on setting up our Eagle One firewall. It's going to cover everything from setting it back into factory default, setting up routing, masquerading, natting, and packet filtering. So first off, we're going to ensure that our wireless card along with every VPN interface has been disabled because what we're going to have is we're going to have a gateway at the end. We want to make sure that this is the only gateway on the network. Uh, Windows tends to have issues with this so we're only going to have one gateway and that is going to be on our wireless um, on our um, LAN interface. So we've gone ahead and disabled the wireless interface. All the others have already been disabled or are currently not connected. And the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and we're going to factory default this Eagle. And the Eagle ships with a factory default of 192.168.1.1. And we're going to see So this eagle is currently is on 1.1. I can ping it, which means that I can talk to it. And what I'm going to utilize is I'm going to utilize High View, and High View is our Switch and Hirschman uh, device web manager that has the Java runtime and uh, directly embedded in it. And this is going to allow us to go into the web management. And we're going to utilize the default password, which is for admin is private, all lowercase. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to go to restart and we're going to select reset to factory. We're going to click on OK. And this device will automatically then reboot. Uh, with this firmware version, you do manually have to power cycle it. Which I've done and what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and we're going to start a ping and it's going to be a continuous ping using the dash T and we're going to wait for this device to come back online and once it does we're going to log back into it I heard the click on the fault relay. Again, private, all lowercase. And because this is a factory fresh device uh, using the newer firmware, it's going to ask us to confirm or change the password. And as you'll notice here, I did revert the or change the password back into private. So it's giving me the alert that the password is the default. So having done this, though, let's go to the routing. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to enable routing for this device. So we have two interfaces. We have a routed interface for port one and a routed interface for port two. The routed interface for port 1 is the internal and port 2 is the external. And it gives me a default of 192.168.3.1, which just happens to coincide with what we're planning on doing here. So in this case, in this plant, we have 20 machine cells. All of the machine cells have a 192.168.3 address, which coincides very nicely with what we need here. If not, I can easily change this. And what we then have is we have an external interface. And for our external interface, what I'm looking for is I am looking for a interface that is going to allow us to communicate with the plant. So the plant is on a 172.16 and a 20-bit subnet. 
So this is going to allow us to go from a 172.16.1.1 um, all the way, I believe, to a 15.254 or something on that scale or magnitude. And what we're going to do is we're going to set our IP addressing for the cells. So every cell is going to have a 172.16.10 and the 10 being the indicator that it's a machine cell. And this being cell 12, it's going to be a dot one two, and then the added one is going to be for our routed interface. This is going to keep our IP addressing scheme uh, continuous, predictable, and um, some logic behind it. So for example, if I had a machine cell number seven, it would be a 10.71 for machine, uh, machine cell 7's routed interface port uh, for the plant. So what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to give this a an address of 172.16, 10 for machine cell, and 12 for the cell number, and 1 for the routed interface and this is a 240 network and the default gateway for the plant is a 172.16.1.1 this was given to us by IT so we'll simply go ahead and hit set and the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to go to global and we're going to go to the router interface so that we're choosing the routed interface as an option and this is going to switch it from a layer 2 device to a layer 3 device and what you'll notice is as soon as I hit the set it's going to put me into a different subnet and with that I will lose communication to the Eagle because it's now or its management interface is now on its routed interface which is the 3.1. So one thing that I now need to do is I now need to go in and change the IP address for my PC and for this I have a little batch file. This makes it a little easier to simply swap back and forth between my IP addressing and You'll notice here that I'm now able to communicate with the Eagle on 3.1. So having logged back in, the next step that we're going to do is we are going to go from our routed interface setup and we want to be able to ping other devices so we've already established that we can ping the routed interface on this I also have a variety of other devices so I have a 3.2 which is my PLC I also have IO which is 3.3 and I also have an industrial PC on 3.4. So these are all devices that are local within this machine cell. And I want to be able to have these devices be able to communicate out and communicate to, for example, this ping device right here, which is, or could be, for example, a historian server. So I theoretically from here, through my routed interface, should also be able to ping this IP address right here. So if we were to ping 172.16.10.121 you'll see that I'm able to ping the routed interface so we know for a fact that routing works. So I should then also be able to ping this 2.2 address but it's not and the reason has to do with the way that ping and the associated MAC address and IP address are relayed throughout the network. 
and for ping to work, one thing that needs to be added is IP masquerading. And what we're going to do with this is we're going to go to network security, NAT, IP masquerading, and we're going to create an entry here, which is a IP address of 0 .0 .0 .0 0 0.0.0.0 with a 0-bit subnet mask. And once we hit set, what it's going to allow us is it's going to allow that MAC address and IP to carry through so that the pings traverse both to and from that device. So having done that, now that we know that we can ping that device, the bulk of our work is done. Uh, one last step that needs to take place is because this is also a firewall, we also need to look at things like packet filtering. So by default, the Eagle has a rule that, dic um, that indicates it's allowed to have any communication outbound. And this has to do with the stateful packet inspection. So communicating out is not a problem. Communicating from the outside in will be. And because we do want that outside in communication, we want to be able to create a rule. It's effectively a any any rule. So I clicked on incoming packet, create. It automatically creates this rule. I selected active, hit set, and now from the outside I should also be able to communicate back in and ping the devices. So looking back at our application here, we've enabled routing, we're able to ping devices out in the network, we're able to communicate back in, but the next step that we want to be able to do is we also want to be able to hide devices. And what we want to do is we want to be able to hide devices that don't necessarily need to be exposed to the network, thus also saving IP addresses on the network. And we only want select devices to be available. So things like the PLC, as well as the industrial PC. And for this, what we're going to do is we're going to enable NAT. And with NAT, what we're going to do is we're going to create a NAT rule. And that NAT rule is going to say that from our internal network of 192.168.3.2 it's going to be seen on the external network as 172.16.10.122 so again machine cell ten, um, or the machine cell designator machine cell number and I'm simply taking the two and moving it from here to here it's just easier to keep this, um, to put a little bit of logic behind it. And with this, hit set and enable it. I'm then going to take the same rule and simply duplicate it. And I want the dot four to be the other device. And it's going to NAT over to a 124 in the 172.16.10 network. And I'm then going to enable this as well. So both are active. So 192.16.3.2 and 3.4 are being translated over to 172.16.10, 122, and 124 respectively. So with that, this is pretty much all that we need to do here. And we're simply going to go ahead and test this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to unplug from the machine cell and I'm going to plug into the plant network. And I'm going to run a little batch file that's going to change my IP address. So I am now this device right down here, 172.16.1.99. And from within here, you'll notice I can ping the 2.22, or sorry, 2.2. .2. So I can ping 
this device from here, which is rather obvious. But I also want to make sure that I can ping the uh, 3.2 and the 3.4 within this network. So we're going to ping 190, sorry, 172, 16, 10, 122. So we can ping that, and we can also ping the 124. We should not be able to ping a 123, obviously, because none was set up right here. And because we're in a completely different subnet, and because we're going through a router, the 192.168.3.3, even though it exists, is hidden from the network. So the next thing that we want to do is, because at this point, any device on the plant LAN is going to have access to the PLC and the industrial PC that we have in our network, we want to be able to restrict it to the device that is only supposed to have access to this. So again, we've only limited the exposure of some of these devices here, but we also want to limit it to the number of devices on the plant network that actually have access to it. So what we're going to do is we're going to utilize a packet filter for this and we're going to take this existing rule here for the incoming packets. We're going to remove it. Oh, of course this is not going to work. I'm not in that network. So let me go back. Change my IP address. I will have to log back in. And under network security, packet filter, incoming packets, we're going to go ahead and we're going to remove this. I will create a new one. And this is going to have a source IP address of 172.16.1.99. And it's going to have a destination IP address of 172.16. Or actually, in this case, it's going to be a 192.168.3.2. We'll go ahead and make this active. And we're going to go ahead and duplicate this again. And this is going to have access to the dot four. So effectively, my PC and only my PC because of the slash 32 is going to have access to the 192.168.3.2, the industrial PC is what sorry the PLC and the dot four which is the PLC. And in this case, by having this, it's going to allow us to be on the network. And switch the IP address again. So I can ping 122. I can ping 124. And obviously there's no 123 as we've proven earlier. And because what I can also then do is I can then also go back into my network interface card and just to prove this concept, so if I were to change this to a 98, I theoretically still should be able to communicate to that device. So as an example, I can ping the server or that ping device on the network. I can ping, actually, no I can't ping the 122 nor can I ping the 124 because of this incoming packet rule. And only by having it, I'm going to do a quick continuous ping, 
just to show the example, so by having a dash T, if I now were to go in here, change the properties, and change this back to a 99, you'll see that I am now able to continue the communication stream between my workstation and only my workstation with these devices. So with this, we have enabled routing, we've enabled IP masquerading, we've enabled NAT, as well as packet filtering, ensuring that only the devices that need to be visible are visible, that we translate the IP addresses accordingly, I'm adding a level of security by hiding devices and by utilizing IP addresses as their best available, limiting the number of IP addresses on the network as a whole, and just ensuring reliable, secure communication on our network. I hope this has been helpful. If there's anything that we can do for you, please feel free to reach out. Thanks for watching, and have a great day. And, of course, there's nothing worse than having just finished a recording only to realize that you did not touch on something that is rather important. So I figured I'd tack it on real quick. So, my apologies. But one thing that needs to be emphasized, and it is rather important, is that whenever you see this load save symbol, this means that you have changes that have not been saved to the non-volatile memory. That means that if you want changes to be persistent through a power cycle or through a reboot, you will need to save your configurations. So simply click on this, and down here at the bottom where it says Save to Non-Volatile Memory and ACA, the ACA is an automatic configuration adapter. In the case of the Eagle, it is a USB device um, that is optionally used. And with this in place, it will also put a backup copy of the configuration on this device. So this is optional. This button here and the function will work with the ACA in place or without. But with it in place, what it allows you to do is it allows you to click and save on this. Either way, it'll save the configuration. And with the ACA in place, it allows you to utilize that ACA and very quickly, virtually hands-off, create a clone of this Eagle configuration on a off-the-shelf factory default Eagle. And with this too, by saving it from volatile to non-volatile memory, now the configuration has been saved within the Eagle. You can now also copy this to a PC. It makes it incredibly fast, incredibly simple to create a backup copy and then also copy it from a PC. So if you have a Eagle that you've just logged into, you can then simply copy that configuration from a PC and apply it. So it's very fast, simple. Uh, the use of this ACA too significantly helps in the time and effort it takes to create an additional copy of this and then only having to change one or two parameters, typically being an IP address. So I hope this has been beneficial and useful. Again, feel free to reach out. Thanks for watching.